There's a lot of silence in today's service. And now a little less. But I encourage you to embrace the silence. It's a tough thing in our culture. But as we carry the cross, we'll do so in silence. As we enter each place, there's deliberate silence. And after the meditation, here we'll have the stations of cross and there'll be silence. But there's also songs as well. Would you stand the words of this first song? We have two contemporary songs. I've been looking for new songs. And this is a new song for our church. Um, I just learned it last week. Uh, but it captures, maybe some of you know it. It captures the essence of today so well. For those of you who are strict uh, Lent followers, I apologize that it has the word Alleluia in it. You can skip that word if necessary. Otherwise, consider it a sneak preview to the Resurrection on Sunday.
song might be a little more familiar. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself. Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. 
And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. Let us pray. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? For this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. O make me thine forever. And should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to thee. Amen. As we begin this very public journey, bearing the cross of our Savior through the streets of our town, in this ecumenical Good Friday tradition that we've observed now for more than a dozen years, even stopping traffic for a few minutes at our community's busiest intersection. It's worth pondering in the midst of that what impact this public witness has, this witness to the meaning of this day what it has on our neighbors who see it from their cars as they pass by or from shop or home windows as we pass by. And whether the message that we intend is anything like what people receive. When I've thought about it, I suppose my hope has been that seeing us walking through town carrying a cross will at minimum remind people that today is Good Friday a solemn day of remembering Jesus' crucifixion. And remembering that, maybe they would be moved to a place of spiritual reflection, maybe even to offer a prayer of thanks to a God willing to bear the cross for them. Maybe remind them and motivate them to attend one of our evening Good Friday services, also offered in the churches of their town. If not then, at least to be sure to worship on Easter. That's what I always hope anyway. But more and more, I think that may just be wishful thinking. I've yet, after all, in all these years of doing this, seen anyone pull over, park their car, and get out and join our parade. Now, some who see us are no doubt happy to note that there are still people who mark these holy days. But others, perhaps missing the cross that leads us might just think we've left the funeral home and are simply on our way over to Val's for lunch. Others may be busy texting and driving and thinking about where they're already supposed to be, might not even notice us at all, unless they happen to get stuck waiting for us as we cross the street, and then they'll mostly notice how slow we move and wonder whether we'll get out of the way when the light turns green. So as time goes by, I guess that I no longer take for granted that people seeing a crowd of others carrying a wooden cross down the street on a Friday noontime, that they will connect that site with any kind of specific religious observance at all. Or that that connection, if it exists, to the Bible stories about Jesus' last day will be understood by them as anything like what we intend it to mean. Now, there was a time not very long ago when it was widely assumed and could be taken for granted that most people were familiar with the stories and symbols of our Christian faith, especially of this day. And even more significantly, that whether they shared the beliefs we have or not, 
it was at least assumed that religious belief was a positive and strengthening factor in their community's life. The basic historic rationale, after all, for giving religious organizations like ours exemptions from property and sales taxes in our culture has been that we contribute greatly in other ways to the common good. We foster positive civic virtues and values, religious or not, like encouraging honesty, charity, hard work. Well, I remember such days when that was a given. I was raised in a culture that broadly held such a positive attitude toward people of religious faith. You didn't need to belong to think that way either. Even non-religious people thought we believers were good to have around. But now for a variety of reasons, some of which are beyond our control and some of which are our own fault, that is largely no longer true. We live in a world where a growing number of people consider religious belief to be a narrow-minded and even dangerous thing, especially if it is a firm and passionate faith, a faith that might change your life and shape your behavior if it's a conviction someone might be willing even to die for. Just yesterday on the Today Show, as part of a week-long series on religion and spirituality, they reported on a survey they had taken to see if people considered religion to be a unifying or a divisive factor in our culture. Only 46% of the responders answered unifying while 54% the majority believed religion does more to divide us than anything else. Now that's not the world I grew up in, but it is the world that you and I live in. More and more people look at the world and its many deadly conflicts and divisions and at the growing list of inhumane atrocities committed in the name of God, and they see religion as the main reason behind it. And since as major world religions, we've all in our own way given them reason to think, think such things, more and more people have found more and more reason to suspect that religions of all kinds might be more a cause than a solution to this world's trouble and violence. And of more consequence in communities like ours, I believe, even many actively religious people, Christians among them, maybe even you, have become persuaded that too much religion is not a good thing. A faith that is taken too seriously, beliefs held too firmly, are more likely to result in conflict and division and should therefore be avoided. Religion, like most things, is now often considered best when kept in moderation, kept in its place in the broader spectrum of life. Even attendance at worship seems to many people now to be better if it's only occasional and not expected or much less demanded every week. Even to the extent that religion still seems to be a positive thing, it is clear that too much of it. Certainly a fervent faith, religious zeal is now widely believed to be dangerous, divisive, even prone to glorifying violence. So what does a world now so deeply suspicious of religious fervor make of our cross-bearing parade? What does it mean for us to glory in the cross and to worship a Messiah who died a grisly and violent death because of his zeal to be faithful to God? What also do we make of the religiously motivated false charges we just heard in the reading? The political perversion of justice that Mark's gospel has told us was at the very essence of Jesus' trial and the decision to crucify him. What is the message of the cross? To a world so caught up in its own divided religions and political camps filled with their own kinds of, visit, of bitterness and evident corruption, or both, what does the cross mean to us who are still in the church? 
and how we can speak about that meaning in ways that can help our neighbors understand that to take up the cross and follow Christ and to seriously and steadfastly bear the cross in our world is not a call to either commit or submit to violence in our Savior's name. Just to be clear, I still believe that zeal is good. I still think that a faith deeply held and that shapes all of life and decision-making is what we have to offer our world. What we proclaim, what we try to nurture in our children and deepen among ourselves in all that we do as congregations. When it comes right down to it, if our faith in Christ isn't worth dying for, it isn't worth much. But that does not mean that division is our goal, certainly not that violence is ever our method. Jesus came, he said, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus came, first of all, to bring God all the way to us, to be God in flesh for us, to bring the life and power and will and way and peace and unity of God into a world trapped in its divisions and abuse and oppression and all the systems of violence that support and sustain it all. Jesus came and comes today to change that way things are into how God wants them, created them to be. Jesus came to both announce and to be the nearness of that kingdom of God, that world in which people live in peace, where the voiceless get heard, where every child is fed and rulers enact a kind of justice that protects the powerless and poor and different in their midst. Jesus also knew that bringing that kingdom's values and that kingdom's goals up against the prevailing values of a broken and sinful and violent world was going to cause division. He knew that the path would lead to a cross, and he said so repeatedly. And his willingness and his zeal and his passion to bear that rejection and violence doesn't mean that he condoned it any more than the crosses on our walls mean that we glorify violence now. We simply understand that when we take seriously our Lord's call to discipleship, division, sometimes painful division from those who do not share our understandings and commitments will happen. And the dying world's habits and tools of violence and oppression and persecution against God's approach will continue. And while some may still claim rejection or coercion or violence as valid tools to advance or protect their religion, including some Christians, we need to be clearer that we reject the ways of death and proclaim God's new life in Christ. The way of God is indeed the way of peace. We call Jesus the Prince of Peace. The new life in Jesus is certainly a life of peace with God and peace within families, peace between neighbors. But it is a peace that comes always through the cross, a peace of the new life that is raised up from the ashes of this world's division and violence and death. The cross, in other words, is for us a sign of love a holy love, an open love that embraces and leaves us vulnerable to pain, a love that is willing to face rejection and suffer loss. The cross for us is a sign of faith, a faith in a God who makes and keeps promises, faith that is not dependent on or a guarantee of things going well or smoothly for us in life, but a faith grounded in a God from whom nothing in all creation can ever separate us. The cross is a sign for us of truth, the truth about our brokenness, our sin, our divisions, our bigotries, our violent proclivities and our tendency to project them onto God and onto our religion. Just as it is, this, just as it is the sign of God's rejection of such weapons and the truth of God's victory over them, that was Easter. And lastly, the cross is for us a sign of service, of the fundamental connection between what we profess as love for God and what we practice as love for neighbor. It is a sign of our willingness, as Paul said, to, not, to look not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. The cross, 
sign of holy love, of trusting faith, of eternal truth, and of selfless service. Maybe it is too much to expect passers-by to understand all of that. And that depth of meaning to our chief symbol and our motivation this day to carry the cross publicly and walk beneath it proudly. Maybe we could do a better job also of bearing this cross of Christ in love, faith, truth, and service all year long so that its message this day might be clearer. Maybe our worship each week in all of our congregations could better enact that kingdom in which everyone is welcome, where all those who hunger are fed, where people who are different in so many ways are yet able to sing the same song with one voice. Maybe then our world would be able to understand more clearly that where the peace of God overcomes violence and division, life is given. And life has holy purpose in looking to the interests of others more than our own. Maybe it would help our neighbors be less suspicious of religious faith if we told them that our worship is where we bring our questions and our doubts and our suspicions so that they can be transformed into faith, so that our despair can be transformed into hope, and so that through, the, through us the suffering world can meet God's love. This day on which we literally bear the cross through the streets of our community in public witness to our faith is a good day to consider just what it is we're saying and just what we hope others will see and hear and understand. So that whenever we find that even what that cross represents to us causes division among us, we can find ways to respond with a deeper and more respectful listening to those across that divide and engage in a zealous seeking of common ground and a search for the unity we claim through that cross. Because it's not good when people are suspicious of religious faith and when they're fearful of a kind of belief that is too fervent, so fearful that they end up feeling safer by keeping religious belief in a very small corner of their otherwise spiritually empty lives. It's not good that our world is wary of our cross because when we look at it, we look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, love, truth, and service, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Through the cross, we know a God that is nearby and not far off, a God who forgives and grants new beginnings, a God who knows and bears our suffering a God who will not let us go, and who on the cross drew all, people, drew all people to himself. Now we just need to find the words and ways to let our neighbors know that belief in this God and belief fervently and bearing this Christ cross daily is nothing to be afraid of. Amen.
regarding him is number 484 in the Blue Worshiping Church hymn in the front. 484, the old rugged cross, let's stand and sing.
this place to continue on our way with the cross, let us pray. Lord Jesus, what is there to say? You've said it all. You laid down your life for us. Out of love, you suffered for us and died. Lord, we know the story. It's old and it's familiar. And yet, Lord, its newness is fresh every day. <clears throat> because of your cross, we are saved. Because of your cross, we are in your covenant. We are your children. We are blessed. Oh, Lord, this year, as every year, speak to us anew the message of the cross. Help us to understand. Help us to ponder and behold its mystery. Help us to find the life that is in your death. Be with us now as we leave this house of worship, as we journey on our way. Remember, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 